Hello, my name is James Gill. Thank you for joining me here on this next clinical skills video. And I'm actually in one of the practices uh, where I locate at the moment, hence the current get up. And we've been visited by uh, limbs and things here today. Uh, basically, uh, the last word in anatomical models for practicing clinical skills. Now, what I mean by that is that they produce a huge number of uh, well, models that we can use in order to allow students to improve their knowledge of clinical procedures without having to learn on a patient. So these tend to be procedures that you wouldn't want to perform repeatedly on a patient. So a good example there being the breast examinations. These guys have uh, a wonderful uh, collection of different breast models, which for myself as an educator and as a clinician, we can actually choose the pathology that we want, place it in different locations within the silicon breasts and have a student model them, allowing for the appropriate examinations to be performed in a non-clinical or an educational setting. There are other models that they've produced which allow us to perform intimate examinations, which can be very difficult to master initially. So these models allow us to uh, practice intimate procedures, but not only the examination correctly, which can sometimes take multiple attempts to get right, and with the models, we're able to do trial and error without any problems. But, such as the breast models, they also allow us to put different pathologies in. So if we're talking about the testicles, we can provide models with testicular tumours, we can do epididymitis, we can do hydrocele's, where the actual scrotum itself is filled full of fluid. And these are amazing what learning uh, devices, um, and they can actually empower students to have a greater level of confidence in their performance of these very difficult uh, examinations. At medical school, when a student is being assessed for, for example, the abdominal exam, they'll do an excellent examination and they'll complete their assessment by giving a, a, a stock phrase such as, at the end of the examination, I'd like to check a urine dip. I'd like to review any stool samples we have, any abdominal x-rays that may exist, as well as perform an examination of the external genitalia and a digital rectal examination. They thank the patient and uh, move on to their next uh, clinical encounter. However, in an assessment setting, that digital rectal examination and that external genital examination are rarely performed, and as such, these are areas where there is space to reinforce the academic book learning that the students go through with physical models which allow them to practice procedures that would not otherwise get the same level of attention as, for example, auscultating the chest does during their revision sessions. And from my perspective, when it comes to teaching those examinations, they don't get the same degree of attention that the big examinations get, such as the cardiac examination, the abdominal examination, the respiratory examination. We go into a lot of the minutiae of those, and we have done in our existing clinical skills videos. However, Something like the JVP could be considered to be less important than that digital rectal examination. Although I have no doubt that there are clinicians of respiratory and uh, cardiovascular backgrounds who will you know, push back quite strongly against that statement. The problem is we teach the JVP very well and our students are able to examine the JVP on each other very easily. Rectal and genital examinations are not easy to practice, and thus we need to rely on companies like Limbs and Things to produce the models that allow us to do that. So, with that background in place, 
we're going to be following uh, the McLeod clinical examination approach to uh, the rectal examination, which we'd expect to be performed at the end of any abdominal examination. Now, another problem with the genital and the rectal examination is they're often examinations that are shied away from, even in the pure clinical setting because of patient discomfort or, as much as we hate to admit it, clinician discomfort at times, which is wrong. Missing these examinations means that pathology can be missed and thus the opportunity to help a patient earlier in their medical journey is lost and that is not an acceptable thing. Thus, today, we're going to focus on how to correctly perform the rectal examination, what pathologies we may encounter during that, and what's the best way to phrase our dialogue with the patient in order to normalise the examination and put them at ease as far as is possible. Now, given the nature of this examination, for this uh, video, the comment section is going to be locked. Now, what I mean by that is we're not saying comments will be unavailable here. Now, I need to be really clear with that. I'm not saying comments won't be available here. But what I am saying is due to the sensitive nature of the video, all of the comments will be held for moderation first to ensure that we're only getting what might be considered to be constructive comments here, whether or not that's questions that we can answer, whether or not it's statements of fact, whether or not it's a general discussion which is appropriate to the video. So I'm sure that everybody will agree that given the nature of the internet, that's an appropriate thing for us to do. So without more ado, let's get our patient onto the couch and let's begin our examination. The Limbs and Things Prostate and Rectal Examiner comes with a selection of five prostates and one new uh, facility, that being the review of impacted faecal matter. The silicon pathologies are taken. So here we have a bilateral carcinoma of the prostate are inserted into the examination device, whereupon the examiner will be able to feel through the rectum the presence of the pathology at the prostate. Limbs and Things have provided a very interesting uh, selection box of um, pathologies. For example, we have here a prostate carcinoma. So for the examination, the finger will go in and we want to make sure that we can feel the central sulcus and examine both lobes of the prostate. Here, the prostate will actually feel quite hard as well as this craggy surface area. We have a benign enlargement of the prostate where we've got a smooth uh, prostate. The central sulcus is still present, but is much less palpable than on a normal prostate. And overall, the size will have increased. You can see the difference between the two if we compare to a normal prostate, where the sulcus is much more pronounced and the size of the prostate is much smaller. So here we have a normal prostate. During the examination, we should be able to feel both lobes and the presence of a central sulcus. When we have an enlarged prostate, we're essentially looking at the same appearance, just magnified. We'll still have a central sulcus, but the two um, lobes will be enlarged. Frequently, the prostate is described in terms of fruit, with the normal prostate being about the size of a lime or a small plum, yet with the enlarged prostate being the size of a tangerine or satsuma. We'll keep the normal prostate here as a guide for different pathologies. The prostate can be enlarged unilaterally, where the finger would feel that one lobe has become considerably larger than the other. This could indicate early pathology and should be investigated appropriately. It's not unusual to find uh, gentlemen as they age develop an enlarged prostate, where both lobes have enlarged equally and the prostate surface remains smooth and remains normal consistency. Any unilateral change is always worrying, hence 
we can get a prostate carcinoma affecting a singular lobe. So here the prostate is not particularly enlarged, but we do have a craggy, hard texture to the prostate, and the presence of the central sulcus is somewhat reduced. Finally, we can have carcinoma affecting both lobes. Frequently, the central sulcus is obliterated, the prostate itself may have enlarged, and will have a craggy surface over its entire area, and will frequently be much harder on palpation than the soft, healthy prostate is normally. Another finding which may be palpable in the rectum may be impacted faeces. We can identify impacted faeces in the rectum because on palpation we can normally leave an indent within the faeces and it should be within the canal and not connected to any of the walls or we can get a finger all the way around it. So here we're looking down the rectum from the inside and it's important that we examine all the way around the rectum during the examination as we can see here the presence of a rectal carcinoma. In order to gain consent for a DRE, a digital rectal examination, note not a PR which is per rectum and that's a method by which drugs will be given we need to explain to the patient what we're doing. The patient must be able to retain that information and weigh it, and they must be able to convey their wishes to us. So we'd explain that we're concerned that they have a problem with their stomach and possibly their intestines, and we need to have a look in their rectum, and that will be done by getting a finger, placing it in the rectum to feel around to see if we can find any pathology, and also getting them to squeeze our finger as if they were trying to pass a motion, thus confirming that they have intact neurological control down there. With the patient happy to go ahead with that, we make sure that we gain a chaperone. Now, previously, people would have proceeded for a digital rectal examination without a chaperone, should a patient wish that not to be the case. I would strongly disregard this, in all situations to protect both yourself as well as the patient, make sure you have an appropriate chaperone in the room. So having a gentleman present if you're doing a rectal examination on a male and a lady present if you're doing a rectal examination on a female. With that in mind, you must make sure that you've prepared yourself correctly. So we're going to wash our hands. We're going to use appropriate gloves and also an apron just in case. Top tip, however, put your gloves on after you've done your apron because it makes life an awful lot easier when it comes to tying the knot. <laughs> there we go, that should about hold. So whilst you're preparing yourself, the patient can also be getting ready themselves for the examination by taking off their lower clothes and returning to the couch, which you'll have hopefully provided them with some um, blanketing in, or sheeting in order to protect their modesty. When you're back in the room, you'll explain to the patient you're going to use some aqua gel on your finger in order to provide lubrication. And you'll also be using a pen torch to look around the rectal area to see if you can see any visible changes there. So we have the patient roll over on their side into the left lateral position and have them shuffle so that their buttocks are on the end of the bed. Whereupon we'll get our pen torch and we'll examine around the rectal area. So using the pen torch we're going to have a look around the anus and we want to see if there's any signs of fissures. We want to see if there's any signs of bleeding or any obvious hemorrhoids or suggestion of anal carcinomas. All of these should be documented. To perform the examination, you'll place some aqua gel on the tip of your finger. You'll approach the anus and you'll apply pressure with the pulp of your finger and steady pressure taking the finger inside. As you pass in, you're going to feel around the anus itself to make sure there's no signs of any uh, cancerous growths and then feeling around on the inside of the rectum again for the same. 
In men, you need to turn your finger around to check the prostate, whereupon we're checking for the presence of both lobes and the central sulcus in between. We want to know whether or not the prostate feels enlarged for its normal size and whether or not it's soft as you'd expect. Slowly withdraw your finger and examine the glove to see if there's any evidence of blood and the colour of the stool. So that will complete our examination. We would step out of the room, allowing the patient to close themselves and invite them back into the consultation room to continue on the discussion about what investigations or further management plan might be required. Well, I hope this has been a useful video for yourselves. I understand that discussions of these sort are very difficult, uh, largely because you know, rectal examinations, genital examinations are very sensitive topics. So I'd be very grateful if you could uh, put some comments below as to how you feel that this video has gone and what you think could be improved upon it before we look at the gentle examination in one of the forthcoming videos. Similarly, if you feel this has been useful, please consider subscribing to the channel and that way you'll get updates as to when we're doing the next videos and also it allows us to engage in the discussion here with the community about things people want to see and how we can improve your understanding of clinical skills. Okay, with that in mind, I'll bid you all good day. Take care.